Heading toward the finish line. Do you feel it? Yes. Glory to God. <clears throat> and I must say that uh, all of this really does lend itself. I'm not going to obviously get into too much, but it lends itself perfectly into going next semester into 1 Corinthians. And I am, Lord willing, not going to spend as much time in 1 Corinthians on the scriptures that you would think. I'm going to spend a lot of time on areas that you probably never have studied or spent much time on. And we're going to see Christ there. And we're going to see Christ and him crucified there. All right. Uh, let me just begin by catching us up and, um, and reading a little bit here. Um, Let's see. <clears throat> so how is building the temple tied to divisions among believers? <clears throat> Let's see, I read that. They, so they were not temper, temple builders as Paul. Uh, clearly these divisions among the people concerning Paul or Peter or Paulus were bringing about divisions and separations among those he described in verse 16 as the temple of God. Now, I'm going to say that again because I think it's important to realize that those who were choosing and lifting up certain ones, well, I'm of Paul, well, I'm of Apollos. They were not just saying that just to, to denote who they liked the best or their preference. They were saying that to get the temple or the people of God in that church to join with them in their particular ones. So if you can see that, then you'll realize that, uh, that uh, well, the wording I put here is, uh, well, clearly these divisions among the people concerning choosing Paul or Peter or Paulus were bringing about divisions among those he described as the temple of God. They are tearing down the temple and dividing the temple. <clears throat> So in the next verse, verse 17, he characterized those actions of causing division as defiling the temple. Again, the proof that he has not left this subject of divisions being the problem is found just a few verses down from those statements, um, af uh, statements about defiling the temple in verses 21 and 23. The apostle sees that the real issue is not the real issue is not straightening people out about division. That is so churchy, folks. That's so religious. It's just so religious. I can't even tell you. It's got nothing to do with Jesus other than, well, this is what he taught us, so we shouldn't do it or something. You see what I'm saying? It has nothing to do with his life. It has nothing to do with us being in the temple. It's just the right way. And doggone it, you ought to feel bad because you're not doing it the right way. You ought to feel worse than bad. You ought to feel Babylonian. All right? All right, so um, uh, let's see. I just don't want to read this whole thing. So it, it, the real issue is not straightening out believers concerning divisions, but bringing them to a greater understanding that they are the temple and the goal is to let Christ crucified live in them. Because that Christ won't be divided. That Christ will lay down his life for others. All right. So uh, if Jesus is the one doing the living within them, then there will be no divisions for Christ. Is Christ divided? No. All right. So the bottom line is that Paul has a problem with divisions because when he sees such things as that, he concludes that it must not be Christ crucified in those causing divisions because it is not after the nature of the one who loved so much that he died to bring the temple into existence. He concludes that you cannot possibly be letting, you cannot, uh, let's put it this way, you cannot possibly really be a habitation of God because he doesn't live that way. So you, so no wonder you're dividing and and tearing down the temple and trying to divide it all up and don't have any compunction or guilt over the whole thing is because 
you don't have Christ, Christ crucified living in you. You're not a temple. You're not a part of the habitation in that sense. <clears throat> All right, so um, the example of this in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, in which it shows us that since he has already described us as the temple of God, we then see that Paul's definition of division is that it destroys God's temple instead of building it up. He sees breaking down the temple as that of dividing the living stones one from another over issues concerning personal preferences and personal rights. <clears throat> and this will become a major issue in the whole book of 1 Corinthians. And the subjects change. But Paul's subject never changes. Let's put it this way. The issue changes, but Paul's subject never changes. And, and you know, I mean, let it be said that we, give, we don't give glory to man, but he is an amazing man in that he keeps his eyes on Christ crucified. That's just all glory to God because none of us, you know, can do that apart from, from the Holy Spirit forming Christ in us. So... To the, apostle Christ, or to the apostle, crucified love, as seen by Christ at the cross, does not divide, but unites. And remember, when he said, who loved me and gave himself for me, he said, this is the one who lives inside of me. You've got to remember that, and I'm dead. This is the life I have now. It's the one I live in the flesh. Yes. Sure. The good thing is, I can repeat it word for word. <laughs> to the apostle, crucified love as seen by Christ at the cross does not divide, but unites. <clears throat> I mean, he, he dies so that it will be united, so that it will exist, so there will come a temple. Folks, the, the end of the tabernacle era was not, well, God changed his mind, now he's going to move to something bigger, or, well, that time's over. The end of the tabernacle era was Jesus dying on the cross to bring about the temple era. You understand what, how I'm saying it wasn't just the end of an era, oh, it's the end of the tabernacle era. I mean, you can, historically, you can look at it like that, but it's not that way because the life got pulled out of that temple by the foreigners. The end of the tabernacle era was Jesus giving up his life and his body so that a temple would come into existence. I don't know how to... Make this, so, and I'm just saying all that. I'm not trying to. I'm. I'm trying to say that to show that this is the same one who's supposed to be inhabiting us. So, if he is, and he laid down his life for the temple, to build it and to bring it. And Jesus said, "I will build my church." He's a builder. Then, if we're the temple of God, if we're the church, then we're inhabited. But we're not just inhabited, we're inhabited by that life and that spirit and that one. All right. However, the Corinthians seem to have devised a new form of Christianity whereby one might still be Christian yet promote divisions if issues seem to run contrary to one's own personal preferences such as gifts of the spirit or personal rights. Yeah, you're jumping ahead, Wanny. <laughs> Not supposed to be jumping ahead, Wanny. <clears throat> um, the, the Corinthians had, I'm going to say it like this, had come into possession of a Christianity that allowed for division with, and no requirement to be called Babylonian. And um, and it was particularly handy to them when issues came up with other living stones. 
And this is, this is what we'll see throughout the whole book of Corinthians. That this was the real deal to them. And as Paul describes it in Corinthians, this temple building is the real deal to God. <clears throat> and it's no light thing, just like the captivity was no light thing, you know. <clears throat> All right. Paul will spend the better part of both letters to the Corinthians dealing with such things, and he does. I mean, I know that I won't even finish 1 Corinthians, but 2 Corinthians is also good, too. In other words, their version of Christianity allows for divisions. But as Paul sees it, true spirituality is not based on gifts or personal rights, but is, divine by, is defined by Christ crucified living through us. He says, but I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto, sorry, I'm going to use one of my words, but as unto babies. See, somehow when you say as unto babes, it doesn't, you go, yeah. <laughs> hey, he can speak to me like I'm a babe. <clears throat> I couldn't speak unto you as spiritual, but as babies. <clears throat> For as long as there are divisions, and that's, that's his wording there. Um, for as long as there are divisions, guess what? Are you not babies? Are you not carnal? Are you not uh, uh, Babylonians? Are you not those who do not build the temple but divide it? You are everything the Babylonians were and yet you read them and you curse them and you you know feel sorry for Israel but, but they got divided because they didn't stay with the one who was the inhabitor of the temple well you can read it in Ezekiel I mean the glory of God the presence of God left the temple And anyway, um, so the goal of Paul is not to get them to end their divisions. And, and how important is that? How important is it that we see that his goal is not to get them to end their divisions, but to take on Christ crucified? How important is it to not end the divisions and make that the issue, but let the temple be inhabited. Let it actually be a habitation, not a rock pile. You know? And, uh, and folks, to divide, to, to, to take a scalpel and to divide this thing that clear like Paul is doing, where he's, he's not about stopping divisions like just about every minister is. He wants Christ formed in us. He wants us to truly be a habitation of God, not in terminology. He wants us to be the body of Christ, not in terminology. He want, but he wants Christ crucified. He wants this selfless one. And he's always, always, always pressing towards that. The proof is when he brought up the divisions in chapter 1 and then he's, he's doing all this dealing in chapter 3, chapter 2, I'm determined not to know anything among you but Christ crucified. The guy is a bulldog. He won't let go. He just sees that, that this is the whole plan. And why would we want to get off from this? You know, and apparently a bunch of the prophets felt the same way, just dealing with the shadow. Why would you? And just appalled, you know. Just appalled that they, that they would just 
you know, it's funny, appalled. <laughs> so Paul comes along and goes, I'm appalled over this. But, you know, you'll, you'll never, not you, not me, not anyone, will ever be able to see this so clearly the way he did unless this quits being a book, but yet we see there the, you know, I'm sorry to say it this way, but it's the, only, it's the best way I can think of off the top of my head. We see Narnia in there. You literally see another land. You see another world. You see another reality. You see, but you see it clearly. You see, you see exactly what it is that God the Father wanted. You see exactly what it is that the Holy Spirit exists for. You see exactly what all the shadows are pertaining to and and from that you are able to gather as it were the equipment of the shadows because Jesus fulfilled it he fulfilled it he didn't you know he's the fulfillment of it he didn't just destroy it i came not to destroy the law but to fulfill and you see it as, you know, not another, you know, little, you know, thank God for these Old Testament Bible stories so that we can teach the kids how to be, how to stand up for God like Jeremiah. Yeah, well, what are we teaching the kids to stand up for? Well, you know, God, you know, whatever that is, whatever they want to put, whatever, however they want to define that, <laughs> you know. Paul saw, and I can, I can show you a million places, and, but the main thing is, we're going to see this in Corinthians. Man, this guy, whew, he is just, it's just clear cut. And, and um, so until, until the Holy Spirit just um, shows us how the Old, Old Testament is fulfilled, instead of totally having nothing to do with that and just trying to teach us some new religion Jesus brought on 2,000 years ago. Folks, what we believe and what we're part of goes back further than 2,000 years. I mean, we're supposed to understand how those things are fulfilled and live according to that. And yet we just ignore that and we're just trying to, you know, well, Jesus is the fulfillment of it, so it's gone. No, how is he the fulfillment of it? We're one with Jesus. How are we the fulfillment in union with him? You understand what I'm saying? We're, we're not the fulfillment of it, but folks, the temple is his body. So it's him the fulfillment of it, but guess what? We're included. And it's just, you know, there's just a whole, there's a break with nominal Christianity whereby the writers of the New Testament are actually talking about all of that, but now they see it as this is the real thing and we're part of that. And to see that, you know, to see that and to enter into that. Um, for example, you know, I'm sorry, I'm jumping around a little bit here, but, you know, it just occurred to me, and I've been meditating on it for a couple of weeks now. Uh, gosh, Paul says, let us keep the feast. Well, and he's talking about the Passover. Let us do the Passover, let us keep the feast. How do you keep the How do you keep the Passover? Does that mean let's go get some Let's go kill a sheep? And, you know what I mean? Do, is that what that's talking about? No. But how many are keeping the feast? I mean, really keep the real feast. How many really even know what that is? How many know that there's a fulfillment of that in 
Christianity in New Testament reality that we keep. You know, and that's just one example. I mean, you know, it's, there, it's everything that's there. All of that's supposed to have a reality uh, with us, and it does. I mean, um, my Bible just accidentally here is open. It was on four, but five. Um, uh, I'm just going to read your scripture. It says, And walk in love as Christ also loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and, and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. And then it tells us in, in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians that we're supposed to be a sweet savor of Christ. What the heck does that mean? Well, I'll tell you what it means. It means that there's a reality of those offerings, Passover and, and sweet savor offerings and feasts and everything that's supposed to be so real. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting off a little bit here, but I'm just going to just tell you. These people that are getting off into all this Judaism in the church and that are, that are you know, they're all trying to, you know, go back to the Old Testament and stuff like that. And some, some of them, folks, are actually having seders, which is the, the, the modern-day Jewish word for Passover and stuff. And they're doing stuff like that. Folks, that's not what he meant. He didn't say go back to the shadows. You know? And, you know, well, we're going to have a holy convocation. What does that mean? I mean, I, I don't even want to go there. Uh, just so many things that they're supposed to be because we are one with him in the living reality of it. There are realities that are supposed to be springing forth in us. How are we going to know any of those realities if we don't even know? You know, if it says for, you know, for you are the Passover, you know, that, Uh, or you are the circumcision, or you are the this and that. How are we going to even know what that is if we don't even know what the shadow's talking about? You know what I mean? You've got to go there first, and then you've got to see the reality of it. But anyway. It's just that every time I teach the tabernacle or the feast or the priesthood or everything, I am overwhelmed with the now reality of these things and how we just see those things as Bible stories and teachings. And we, we might even learn that stuff, but we learn it in a way that we try to impress people with our knowledge of the Bible instead of see Jesus and then let Christ live through us as that sweet savior. You know. Anyway, you think I'm, I'm going to quit. I'm going to try to stop. Stop talking about that right now. All right, so the goal, I just read, the goal of Paul is not to get them to end their divisions, but to take on Christ crucified. To destroy, separate, and divide the body of Christ is to destroy the temple, but love, not knowledge, builds up. And that's what he says, love edifies. Isn't that an amazing phrase? You know, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. I mean, that's the actual translation, folks. Well, what do you think it's building up? Well, Ephesians 2, 21 and 22 says, talks about building up us unto a holy temple in the Lord. You know? And, uh, and by the way, that scripture is also in 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> it builds up just as Ezra and Nehemiah did. Remember, Paul's not just applying the temple as, and this here, see, I said I was going to stop and here it's written here, but... <clears throat> Remember, Paul is not just applying the temple as a metaphor. Paul's not using the... Uh, I'm going to use a metaphor. The temple is not a metaphor. They're the real temple. Do you see what I'm saying? I mean, you know, he brings in the subject of the temple. We go, oh, yeah, he's drawing from the Old Testament. And since, you know, we're Jews, he's trying to... Well, first of all, a lot of those people weren't Jews. This is to the Philippians, you know. But, you know... He's going to use this metaphor of the temple. He's not, the temple is not a metaphor. He says, know ye not, you are the temple. <laughs> Golly. So remember, Paul is not just applying the temple as a metaphor to the situation so they might better understand his meaning. 
He believes that the situations he is now dealing with concerning divisions is the true issue of God's heart of which the Lord chose to depict in shadow form by Solomon's temple in the captivity of Israel years later. That, that, that the situation that he was, that Paul was in right this second was forever the real, the eternal. That's the truth. And I am not going to use that as a metaphor. You, you know, this is not about them but it is about us. <clears throat> For the apostle, the situations before him involving the Corinthians was much more serious than the captivity, which was set in motion by God only as a shadow of what was to come in the New Testament. See, they could, be, they could have been prepared. And, you know, Paul was, had... Paul was a Pharisee before he came to the Lord. You know that? So he knew the scriptures. He knew all of this stuff. I mean, what a blessing is that? I mean, to really know the scriptures and then begin to have Christ revealed where? First and foremost, in the scriptures. And he's going, this guy's it. This is it. You know, and we go, well, you know, they're... You know, like in Nehemiah's day, they're building the wall around the temple, and they're, you know, and they're all got one hand on their sword and one hand they're building with, and they're all dependent on one another. And we see that and we go, oh, God, oh, if I could just be in something exciting, and the enemy's trying to come in and tear down the walls, and if I got just, you know, but instead I sit in a cold room with seven people. Or how, I mean, yeah, I know there's more, but I'm just saying, and. <laughs> And, and it's just, you know, uh, you know, God help us. I just wish there was something exciting in my life. There is. This is it. This is the deal. But we take that more serious. We think that's more real. Shame on us, you know. And, and I can't remember the exact words, but upon whom the end of the age has come, all of it comes right down to us. And whatever those guys went through, it was a shadow. And, and if they could see today, they would go, oh, my God, I just want to be in there with them. And I just want to have one hand on my sword, you know, and one hand working for the kingdom of God and lifting up my brothers. And, you know, in that scripture, Nehemiah says, fight for your brothers. Build is really, he's saying, fight for them so we can build this thing together. You know, we go, oh, if I was in that day, or if they made a movie of this, and I was watching the movie, and said, fight for your brother, and you'd go, yeah, I'll do it. And then you walk back to the Bible school and go, <laughs> that movie got me all charged up, and I had nothing to do. Just lousy tomb over there. No, sir. This is it. We are blessed to be living in this time period, in this place with the Lord. Not this place, but you. you know. <laughs> All right. Uh, you know what? I've almost got only one. I've only got one paragraph left. <clears throat> what? <laughs> All right, if y'all be th quiet, we'll get through this. <clears throat> Notice how the same theme concerning the temple is used in 1 Corinthians 8, 11, as was used in chapters 1 through 4 about destroying God's temple. Again, he sees division in those who, are, who sow it as sinning against Christ, the Christ who died for them sinning against Christ crucified, sinning against Christ in his selfless giving by claiming to be aligned with him but living contrary to him. I'm jumping ahead, but this is, this is Corinthians. In chapter 8, it seems that the divisions have been on the basis of the Corinthians forming themselves into two separate groups. 
Those who have knowledge and those who are more ignorant are weaker. We'll stop there. So there's going to be some good stuff coming. It really was. But it was great because, you know, it is the closing of the, tab the temple and the house of God. It really is a perfect way to end. We end in the New Testament. We are that. We've, we've come to the true meaning of it all. I mean, there was a lot of teaching about and everything moving this direction, the progression of the house of God. We are, no, you're not. We are the house of God. We are the temple of the Lord. But all of that in these last two classes being built in 1 Corinthians. And that being where I wanted to go next anyway. So anyway, let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your Holy Spirit, and he's the one who will teach us and guide us and bring us into remembrance. And Lord, these last two classes are also seeds for what's coming. And so, Lord, I just pray that you'll water those seeds in the ones that are going to be here, and they'll just be filled up and prepared. Only you can do that. And all we can do is have faith in you and trust you. And we have faith in you, and we trust you, and we thank you that you want to bring us into your fullness and your reality and your world as you see it and as you know it instead of always trying to drag you into our world as we know our world and so we humbly and heartfelt ask you to to continue to open our eyes and our hearts and expand us to be a greater habitation for you thank you for the holy spirit Thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit. We give you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all the glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're dismissed.